without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dan and Patrick to the stage. Hello. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. Got a full house tonight. This is great. Dan, thanks for coming all the way across the lake to be with us. I'm happy to be on this prettier side of the lake. Oh, I was, that's not fair. I was going to like make a jab, like some kind of quip, and then you just admitted it. That's, we got the sunset over on this side, right? And the dunes. And the dunes, yeah. That's always nice. Well, jumping right into it, I guess, you know, they say not to judge a book by its cover, but uh, both of your books, Death and Life of the Great Lakes that we talked about, and The Devil's Element, they have really gripping covers, and uh, the the inside matches that as well. And first off, I wanted to ask you about that. I mean, both of these images that we see really match the tone of the book. And I kind of, I know you probably didn't take these photographs, but I wondered if there's any any story there about these striking covers. Yeah, the, the Death and Life of the Great Lakes cover, I actually was at a gallery night in Milwaukee. It was, the theme of it was surfing the Great Lakes. And so they had all these fantastic pictures of Great Lakes surf and surfers. And this one was just kind of haunting. And I wanted to buy it for my house. And I was in the middle of writing the book. And a couple of years later, they came to me with a couple of mock-ups for the cover. And one was Niagara Falls, which is spectacular, but it's its own thing, you know? Definitely. And um, there were a couple others that just, one was a, a big lighthouse and that echoed too much i thought jerry dennis's great work he has a you know, fantastic book we needed something a little more original and so i remembered this and i tracked the guy down on facebook and asked him if he'd be willing to you know let us use it or let us buy it for the cover and uh he said yeah and then the publisher found out and said you know you should not be involved in these negotiations <laughs> And uh, it went from there. And so that, that picture is, is actually from my hometown in Milwaukee. It was taken in a storm. He, he knew, uh, the photographer knew somebody in maintenance, and they, they had him harness up and strap in because the wind was really howling. It's like a 35-story. It's the tallest building in Milwaukee. And he got that image, which I thought was really haunting. And I sent it or suggested it to the publisher and they're like, yeah, let's do it. And what's really cool is there's a boat in there. And, and then this next cover, I'm starting to think of them because this, the other, this phosphorus book just came out on Tuesday. And so I, like I have four kids and I have in my mind, my names for them that I don't share with anybody, but uh, I'll share with you. I have a green book and a blue book. now. <laughs> that's the way I look it's at like it. It's like the Beatles white album. Yeah. It's kind of, yeah. It simplifies things, but that cover, came came completed they i was in the middle of working on the book and the publisher said my editor said would you like to see the cover and i said no it's just going to distract me like the first time and he said i think you want to see it and he sent it and th they just nailed it so it, there isn't a note inside the cover but that's lake erie and i i don't know if you've seen the book out on the on the desks or on the tables out there but if you have um or maybe you bought it, which is even better. I keep holding um, it up, but I don't think you'll see it that well from where I'm sitting. Anyway, the swirl, the green swirl, it looks like a fire. And that's Lake uh, Erie, and that's a toxic, poisonous algae bloom. And, and then they came up with the subtitle as well, uh, Phosphorus in a World Out of Balance. And I worked at a newspaper for, worked at newspapers for almost 25 years or something. And I, I never trusted uh, editors to write headlines, but, and this isn't technically a headline, but that's exactly what it's about. And yeah. they really nailed it. And so I was very happy. Yeah, I, I'd agree. And, and, you know, this book takes us all over the world. Obviously your first book is very focused on the Great Lakes region. This is a global issue, the, the problem with phosphorus pollution in water, but you do spend a lot of time focusing on the Great Lakes. And I guess on that note, I'd like to ask you, like, what, what is your connection you know, to this place and your background in being a person from, from this part of the world. Sure. Yeah. I grew up in Green Bay, Wisconsin, <laughs> not far from here as the, <laughs> as the seagull flies. A long drive though. It's a, weird. a very long drive. Yeah. yeah. I actually, I, I went to the school at the university of Michigan. So for my first couple of years, I would drive through Chicago and just arrive at school exhausted and stressed. And then I realized I could go over the top and <laughs> take the bridge and, you know, not hit, see a stop sign or a traffic jam along the way. And, and when my dad was feeling generous, he'd 
let me take the badger. It used to run from Kiwani to Ludington. Now it runs to Manitowoc. But yeah, I'm a, a son, if you will, of the Great Lakes. And um, I spent my summers on the Door Peninsula, which, which is really not far from here. And, and then after I graduated from college, I, um, I had a degree in history, which left me with not a lot, but just confidence that things would work out. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, uh, I hopped in my car and I went out west and I got a job at a newspaper in Ketchum, Idaho. Sun Valley, Ketchum is kind of a fancy ski town, but it had a, two very good papers. And that's where I, I launched, launched. <laughs> that's where I started my career. And from there, I went to Idaho Falls and then to Salt Lake City and just picked up the trade of newspaper reporting along the way. And then I got a little bit more uh, specialized because I was in such a hotbed for environmental issues. This was in the early 90s. So wolf restoration to Yellowstone and central Idaho was a big deal. Grizzly bear recovery and then salmon. They, they were all big, big issues that were happening right, you know, in, in the coverage area of our my little paper. And um, I came back to Wisconsin, to Milwaukee in 2002. We had our first child. She was like a year and a half old. And uh, we felt the tug of home. And you spend a decade in the desert, you come back and look at that lake and it's just, it's, you see it in a whole different light. They didn't hire me to cover the Great Lakes at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. They hired me to be a feature writer, but about six months in the editor, I'd like to see, and he was half exasperated and half thrilled that somebody was taking the initiative and he's like, you just want to make it your beat? And which means that's that's all you'll cover. And I figured if I if I didn't claim that, I was going to be covering something that I didn't want to cover. So I said, yeah. And that launched me on a on a it's it's 2023, 21 years I've been covering the Great Lakes, and so here I am. And how how did it kind of happen that that feature reporting turned into this book that was nominated for the Pulitzer, won the L.A. Times Book Prize? I mean. How did that feature reporting lead into a nonfiction work like this? Well, so 10 years into my, my beat reporting on the Great Lakes, now I have four kids and uh, still living in Milwaukee, and I wanted them to see something broader than the Milwaukee suburbs, the North Shore suburbs. And uh, so my wife and I packed up our minivan, and my dad packed up his minivan because he helped us move, and we went to... Uh, New York to uh, Riverdale, New York, which is in the Bronx. But it, 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 when you say you're in the Bronx, this is kind of the Bronx light, I guess. It, it's a pretty gentrified place. And um, I enrolled at Columbia University for a MA, an MA program in science journalism. It was, it was a fellowship. It was basically my sabbatical. I thought I was going to take a breather and show my kids a bit of the world. And it turned out to be an exhausting uh, program, but it included a book writing seminar, and I got pretty numb to, just like I was saying earlier, how, you know, you come back from being gone from the Great Lakes, and you see them in a whole new light. Well, I had been covering them for too long, and I kind of let it be lost on me how spectacular the lakes are, and strange the story of them is, and when I was sitting at this table in New York City telling people stories of, like, the sea lamprey, and the alewives and the mussels and um, people were just scratching their heads and and kind of they were more interested than they thought than I thought they'd be. And the professor said, you know, that's got to go between two covers. And I wasn't interested in writing a book at the time because I was still a full time employee at the Journal Sentinel. I was trying to complete a master's degree and I was trying to be a father to my four kids and a uh, husband to my wife. So I had a pretty full plate. I didn't want to lose any of that. Uh, but I found the time and took me, uh, took me a couple of years after I got back from, from New York to, to come out with that book and that book begat that book. So. Yeah, definitely. Which, I mean, get, getting into this book, I guess this one, the first one does have a whole section about, phosphorus about toxic algal blooms specifically in Lake Erie was there a moment when you were working on this book when you thought this topic of phosphorus pollution in water needs its yeah, whole own yeah yeah I remember I was in my basement which is where I was working at the time 
And uh, I started, I was working on a chapter about Lake Erie and what happened in 2014 when Toledo lost its drinking water supply due to toxic algae, which was driven by phosphorus. So I needed to learn some things about phosphorus. And one of the frustrating things about writing the Great Lakes book was I felt really kind of hamstrung or shackled because I was tied to all the reporting that I had been doing for the last 10 years. And I was given free reign by the editor and publisher at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel at the time to use whatever I had written in the paper in any fashion I wanted to in this book. And it at first felt like, wow, this will be a breeze. But it turned out, and I have known nothing about construction, but I think it was like the difference between rehabbing an old house or building one from scratch. Because I would try to change some pieces that I had written originally for the newspaper because they were dragging or because they didn't make the connection that I wanted to. But I realized that it had all been written in a very compact, tight way. So it would be like taking out a load-bearing wall. And it's like, no, it doesn't work. So I kind of fantasized at the time about building one from scratch. And when I came across phosphorus during the research for the Lake Erie chapter, and when I learned about how it was first discovered, I thought, whoa, this is way more interesting than the Great Lakes. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I kind of just put that in the back of my mind. And once the Great Lakes book came out and the publisher was happy with it, uh, the editor came to me and said, do you want to write another book? And I said, yeah, actually I do. And he said, w about what? And his idea, actually, this is relevant for here. He thought pipes, like a history of pipes and pipe issues today. And I know a thing or two about the pipe issue up on uh, the Straits of Mackinac, but it was a little too technical for my taste. I don't know though, because my answer was phosphorus. <laughs> and it, we were on the phone and there was some silence. <laughs> I could probably hear him doodling, at least that's the way it goes in my memory. And he said, oh yeah, what about it? And, um, and, and I spent two years writing this book proposal for the Great Lakes. So I, I was out in New York for 10 year, after 10 years of working at the paper. And then I came back to the paper and went back to work. And the agent kept having me finesse this book proposal about the Great Lakes. And the whole process took two years before I was able to write it, which took another two years. And this, I thought, well, you know, at least I have a job. Uh, I'll try to sell it to him over the next two years. But I, I sketched out a, a um, uh, outline for the, for the book that, you know, I felt like I was just doing a rush job. But it took two weeks, and it took him like two days to say, yeah, let's do it. And so he had a lot, of, a lot of faith that a lot of other people didn't do. Because if you want to kill conversation at a party. <laughs> just talk about phosphorus. People, you're a writer. Yeah, what's your, what are you working on? And you just say phosphorus. And they look at you like you were just diag told them you were diagnosed with something that you didn't want to be diagnosed with. And so in a way, I spent the time writing this book as an argument <laughs> to why, why it's not so dreadful of a topic to read I'm, about. I mean, I'll tell you straight up that I did, I saw the book and was like, all right, I'm going to read about a book about phosphorus, like deep breath, like <laughs> let's know. log through I know. But that's not at all how it felt. I mean, you get right into it with a police chase scene. I'll, I'll let you all read it for yourself. But like from the get-go, there's action in this book. It's, it's really colorfully written and not a single part about it was, was dragging at all. You mentioned one thing that made you want to pursue this topic was the the discovery of phosphorus like historically yeah. so i'd love to get into this because there's there's so much good stuff in here about the history of phosphorus that was the part that really sticks with me the most is some amazing things from the past that i was never ever taught and would never ever learn maybe it's because you were a history student i guess but starting at the very beginning i guess the beginning of where this history starts 17th century germany yeah um, something... it wasn't a scientist it wasn't a chemist but well but it was alchemist, alchemist yeah. right so both Tell us about, you know, what is alchemy and how did it lead to the discovery of elemental phosphorus? Well, the first thing you want to do if you're going to write a book about phosphorus is come out of the gate hard. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> because you've already half lost the person <laughs> who's wondering why some relative gave him a book about phosphorus. Right. You know, so, so I had a couple ideas of how to start the book. And what really interested me when I was doing the research on the Great Lakes book was its discovery. And so the thing about phosphorus is it's, it's one of the elements. It's number 15 on the periodic table. And that's about the depth I'm going to go chemistry-wise. But um, 
it doesn't exist in the natural world on its own. It's always bound with something else. It's typically oxygen atoms, phosphates. And uh, so phosphorus itself, we never see it if we just let the natural world behave as it does. But this alchemist in 1669, I'm going from memory, um, he was searching for the philosopher's stone, which was this magical substance that they thought could turn any base metal into, into gold. And so a lot, a lot of people, you know, believed that this substance existed and it was just a matter of identifying it, refining it, and uh, making money off of it. Some people thought it was in blood. Some people thought it was in the animal world or plant life. And this guy, Hennig Brand, was a urine man. <laughs> <laughs> he believed that you could, you could uh, find the philosopher's stone in the human waste stream of, of urine. And so I don't know where he got it, but he got vats of urine, V-A-T, vats of urine, and he started monkeying with it. And what he did uh, was pretty extraordinary. I mean, it's, it's simplified in the book. It's simplified anytime people talk about it because you just think of a guy like a wizard type guy in a lab stirring a, a pot of urine until there's phosphorus. And it, it involved a lot more than that. Um, involved, you know, hocus pocus. He was adding this and that, and he was heating and then condensing and then scraping the condensation and then treating that with this. And um, eventually he got these, these waxy luminescent or phosphorescent nuggets of, of, of pure phosphorus. It's very dangerous stuff. Uh, if it's, once it's separated from its, from its oxygen atoms, it becomes very, very volatile. And if it warms above 80 degrees Fahrenheit, it will just spontaneously combust. So I had an idea that I would open the book by replicating this guy's experiment. I have a turkey fryer. <laughs> I have two propane tanks. You know, one's a backup, but they all both end up being empty at the same time, which drives my wife crazy. <laughs> I had some safety goggles. I uh, had, he passed away last year, a father-in-law who is a chemical engineer whose career was working on catalysts for uh, nitrogen uh, for fertilizer. So he knew a thing or two about this stuff. And he was this cranky old English guy. And he said, we're not going to get there, but we can have some fun trying, I guess. <laughs> he was going to come up for uh, Thanksgiving and, uh, you know, He'd help me fry a few turkeys, so this seemed almost a little safer. Then I got a hold of uh, this guy at Johns Hopkins University who specializes in replicating the alchemist's work, and uh, he quickly disabused me of this idea that we could get anywhere close. He explained that uh, the process... Well, hold on, Dan. Maybe I'll just have you read his reply. Oh, if you want sure, to. yeah. Because you've got... To. Yeah, so you, you had this plan, you know, I'm going to basically concentrate... My, as much urine as you can get and get it down to elemental phosphorus. Recreate this experiment from yeah. 1669. You reached out to a chemistry professor yeah. and uh, you have his reply right here in the book. You yeah. could verbatim. Look it was at that cut and there. pasted from an email. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh my gosh. He <laughs> replied, it's awful. Double exclamation point. The problem is that one needs to reach red heat to reduce the phosphates in urine to phosphorus, and modern glassware is simply not adequate for the task. Brand, the chemist, the alchemist, and others use stoneware retorts which aren't produced anymore. Secondly, even if one solved that problem, one still has the issue of condensing white phosphorus vapor into a solid without the entire apparatus exploding in a ball of white fire. Yes, folks in the 18th century and a few in the 17th managed this, but the process rarely worked adequately and often re enough resulted in serious or fatal injury. Only a handful of people ever managed to make it work right, and usually only those who had watched someone in the know do it for them first. I certainly like to redo old experiments, but this is one I think I'd pass on. Parentheses, yes, I did try it once long ago without results. <laughs> so I had to find a new lead for the book. <laughs> Definitely, which you did. And I mean, yeah. moving on from that, that history, at that time they were searching for the Philosopher's Stone, like you said. 
a couple centuries later, people came to understand the importance, or at least came to use phosphorus for the purpose of growing food. Phosphorus is an essential element to agriculture, along with nitrogen and potassium, and it plays a huge role in fertilizers that help feed the planet, really. So I guess if we could continue on in some of the crazy history you get into in this book, a couple centuries later in England, people are looking for a source of phosphorus to grow food, to feed an island with scarce farming land available, you know? Yeah. And some of the means that people went to to get this stuff for agriculture were pretty drastic and kind of dark. So I was wondering if you could tell me a bit about where one of these sources of phosphorus came from at that time. Sure. And at first, they, they weren't looking for element P. They, they didn't know what it was about manure that made stuff grow or right. different different materials. But, you know, it only makes sense. It's very intuitive that if a piece of land is going to grow a crop, eventually the nutrients in that soil are going to be depleted and they need to be replenished. And that was what was so elegantly simple and beautiful about just a family farm. You know, grass grows, the cow poops, grass grows, the cow eats it, the cow poops, grass grows, and on and on. It's the circle of life. And, you know, that happened not just in this bucolic setting, but in forests and everywhere on the planet. These phosphorus molecules just kept recycling from the dead into the living, into the dead, into the living. And so um, they figured out that there were certain substances. This is, now we're jumping ahead. Phosphorus was discovered in 1669. It wasn't recognized at the time as a, as a nutrient. It was just recognized as this curiosity that was very dangerous. Um, but so they started refining their search for uh, fertilizing materials and they honed in on bones. And the way I saw it through my research was the first clue was they were using shavings from knife factories because uh, knife handles were, were bone. And so this shaved bone, you'd spread it on a, on a crop of turnips and boom, it was, it was magical. And so they started using bones as well as manure. And it wasn't just cow manure, it was human manure. Was, they were throwing blood, hair, claw, clothing, claw, fabrics, everything they could think of on the ground to see if it would work. And bones were magical, so magical that uh, the hunt for them became pretty insane by today's standards. There's a section in the book, I go to the Battle of uh, Field of Waterloo, which took place in 1815. And uh, on the day I was there, that battlefield, which is like a, it's not much bigger than a couple of big golf courses, or it doesn't look that much bigger. And it's now farm field. And uh, I was, there's a big observation point and I was looking out and uh, I thought I'd walk down because they were harvesting. I didn't know what it was at the time, but they looked like these little giant softballs, actually, kind of little bowling balls. They were yellow. They kind of look like they look like what you would expect a skull to look like after it had been sitting in the ground for 200 years. <laughs> so I walked down, and the, this guy working the combine is taking a break. And um, I don't speak uh, German or French or Flemish, or all the languages that they speak in Belgium. So I just typed into my phone with the translator, do you ever find, in French, do you ever find bones here? and hand it up to the guy, and he can't get that phone out of his hand fast enough, it sticks it back into my hand, and it's like, no, no. And I, I, I didn't at, the point, at that point realize, uh, you know, the inappropriateness of the question, because 40,000 people died on that land, and, uh, and thousands of horses, and there are no bones on it anymore, and there haven't been bones on it for about 200 years because five years, six years after the battle, the British went back, the, you know, Wellington won, Napoleon was vanquished and the British went back to reclaim their spoils and that was the bones. They, they stripped the whole battlefield of every clavicle and femur and fibula and any other bone you can think of. And they built these bone crushing mills in England to, to make dust to spread on the crops. And so that was kind of the dawn of chemical fertilization. And it, it worked wonders. The problem is there's only so many bones out there. <laughs> and they ran out. And so the first 
I think the book is organized. I know it's organized, but I can't remember how it is in print, kind of the, the hunt for phosphorus. And that kind yeah. of launched the hunt. So they ran out of bones and the next great source was uh, bird poop, specifically from these islands of uh, Peru on the west coast of South America. All these birds would eat all the fish coming up the Humboldt current from way down south and they would nest and uh, you know hatch on these islands where it never rained. So their poop over eons just accreted. And it just turned out that that poop was loaded with phosphorus. And this is in about 1840. So you know they started with the bones from Waterloo and other places in the 1820s and they didn't think they'd run out and then they did. And then they started with the uh, bird poop in the 1840s or 50s, and they thought they would never run out because these are literally mountains of chalky, dusty, bird poop, phosphorus-rich fertilizer. But by the 1890s, 1900, they were gone. Yeah. So meanwhile, human, humanity keeps growing because we're finding all this phosphorus and able to grow crops. The, you turned right to what I was going to turn to, which is that I mean, all these stories we're telling about the way that people got phosphorus seem so dark, and I mean, they are. And also, you talk, I won't get to give away everything in the book, but you talk about, you know, some human rights issues with the labor that went into getting this guano from these islands and the, the little yeah, it was to no Yeah, basically wages. slavery, yeah. Right. And, and I mean, all the things we're talking about with phosphorus for fertilizer are dark and are bad, but like, we can't ignore the fact that, I mean, what kind of role has phosphorus played for feeding the planet? Like, would we see a world today like we do? without chemical fertilizers. No, no, not even close. Like in 1900, we had a billion or I can't remember, billion and a half people and where we at, eight billion now. And like half, half of humanity wouldn't be here if it wasn't for chemical fertilizers. And the three big components to that are potassium, nitrogen, and phosphorus. And uh, we're not in danger of running low on nitrogen or potassium anytime soon, but phosphorus is a different story. But yeah, it's the reason that uh, half of us are here. <laughs> which half gets to be here and which doesn't if it's not here is a, is a bigger question than I'm equipped to answer. But it, it is, it, it, it brought, it, it is ushered in the modern world. Yeah, and so, I mean, we need this stuff to grow food, to feed the planet. It's essential for agriculture. But at the same time, when too much of it gets into our water, you get this, you get these green slicks, these toxic algal blooms. Could you talk a bit about how that happens? I mean, how is it that something so essential for agriculture can make our water so poisonous? Well, in simple terms, it's just because, it's because this stuff doesn't stop fertilizing when it washes off a farm field. You know, when it washes into a lake, it'll grow whatever's in there. And too often today, that is uh, toxic algae. And that's one of the things that I discuss in the book. It's the phosphorus paradox. It's this idea that, okay, so we got to back up a little bit to catch up. Yeah, back so up. so we, uh, we went from, we went from uh, bones to guano and then ultima poop. ultimately to stones. I think one of the chapters is bones to stones, which explains this jump. But after, uh, after the Guano Islands played out and after the battlefields and where the <laughs> graveyards played out, um, we were left on the hunt again. And whew, I don't want to go too far into it because it, it's, I, I got it real quickly. So, so <laughs> these early pioneering paleontologists were scouring the seacoast uh, of the UK, led by this woman named Mary Anning, who more people, like I didn't know about, I came home and told my daughter about this Mary Anning and she's like, we have a book on her upstairs. But she was a famous pioneering uh, paleontologist. She is allegedly or legendarily the inspiration of the poem, She Sells Seashells by the Sea Shark. That's why I only had one beer before because I thought I was gonna have to say that. <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, she, she was just extraordinary at, at, at finding these complete intact uh, creatures, sea creatures. And, and these guys, I mean, they're, they're so hungry for phosphorus, they found intact fossils. And in, in their digestive tract, they, they called them basos stones for some reason, but it was fossilized poop. 
And there's Justice von Liebig, a famous chemist of the time. This is now we're, we're in the 1820s. He's like, well, if poop works so well as a fertilizer, I wonder if fo fossilized poop would work. And they did an analysis of it, and they found that it had the properties that were necessary, phosphorus, for it to be a, a suitable um, fertilizer. So that helped them make the jump from, from hot, steamy manure, if you will, to cold, hard rocks. And it wasn't just the guts of fossilized dinosaurs they found. It was sedimentary rocks, which is, you know, in a lot of cases, just the, the result of dead life raining down on the seafloor and accreting over eons and then fusing into this rock made of dead stuff that eventually, through tectonic processes, gets heaved on Earth, uh, on, on, onto land, and then it can be mined. So... So we made the that's jump. That's still what we use today, right? It that is. We, we it use is sedimentary rock to get sedimentary fossils. rock. So that's how we made the jump from 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 bones all the way to stones. And again, when we realized that we could mine rock for our food, which is a really hard thing to get your head around, like we we're eating rocks in a way. I mean, we're not, but we need the rocks to eat. So in a way, we are. Um, and once we made that jump, we thought, aha, you know, we've got a everlasting supply of it. This is like the third time they're thinking this, they being us. I think yeah. I can guess what happens. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's not inexhaustible. It's a finite resource. And so this is the paradox that we're in today. We're, we're using it at an unsustainable pace. And like in the United States, our primary deposits are in Florida, and it's been estimated that we're going to run out of these uh, reserves, they call it. Those are the ones that have been geologically defined and deemed suitable for, for, for fertilizer, but also economically harvestable. And uh, they're talking three or four decades. And, and there's some deposits in Idaho and North Carolina. They're not, as I understand it, as extensive as what we once had in Florida. But then, but then we're on the hunt, the U.S., uh, once again, for, for phosphorus, sedimentary rock phosphorus, and 80% of it right now is in Morocco and Western Sahara. So this can cause some instability coming, and even those deposits, with the pace we're on as far as population growth and changing diets around the globe, there's been some people who have estimated, you know, it could become, it's never going to disappear, but it's going to get like peak oil, it's going to be peak phosphorus, it's going to get harder and harder to find like in a century. Other people say it's like 300, 400 years. Either of those don't look good in the long no, term. <laughs> but then the paradox is that there is a scarcity of this stuff and we're on the hunt. But at the same time, there is an overabundance in our water. That's what Exactly. That's, that's the paradox. We're, we're still squandering it. I mean, we could be using it much more efficiently and we're not. And that is to the uh, detriment of, of, our, of our fresh water. So it's really kind of a collision course. We need food. We desperately, we need water desperately. And they seem to be uh, at, at cross purpose, the, the pursuit of each are in some ways at cross purposes. And we're gonna be, it's gonna become more and more common. I mean, it's like when you buy a car, say you buy a red Volkswagen Jetta and then all you see are red Volkswagen Jettas, right? Or when my wife was pregnant, all I saw were pregnant people. Once you start tuning into this phosphorus dilemma, you see it in, in journals and in newspaper articles. I think in the book, like in 2021, there were stories on 400 different water bodies that had toxic algae blooms, and those are driven by phosphorus overdose, primarily from agriculture runoff. Right, and I guess get, getting into that, like how does it happen that phosphorus in the water leads to a toxic algal bloom, which are poisonous to, to people? It fertilizes it and you know what, what's going on why it's becoming toxic so like in the 1960s lake erie was famously declared by the time or newsweek or one of the magazines as america's dead sea and that's because it was suffering horrible algae outbreaks dr seuss even wrote about it dr right. seuss in 1972 in the lorax took a crack at lake erie you know calling it like water is smear like fish are escaping water that's so smeary i hear it's just as bad up in lake erie and uh, this is, and it was, it was a fair assessment because Lake Erie was a mess at the time. And what was driving it back then was phosphorus, but it wasn't coming from agriculture so much as it was coming from detergents. 
phosphorus was a big primary component of detergents that really didn't hit the market until the 1950s and 60s because I, before I started doing research on this book, I thought soap and detergent was just the same thing, but it's like the difference between a rocket ship and a skateboard. I mean, the, the detergent is so heavily engineered and a big component of it was phosphorus. And so all of a sudden in the 50s and 60s, you had these horrible algae blooms. And at the time, some must have been toxic, but a lot of them weren't. It was just like this cladophora that plagues uh, Sleeping Bear Dunes, the, the gunk, yeah. spinachy stuff. That was, that was a big problem on Lake Erie back then. And they figured out that it was the phosphorus fertilizing it from detergents. So they reformulated uh, detergents. And um, the problem was, was fixed very quickly and very dramatically to the point that in 1985, some researchers at Ohio State University uh, wrote the good Dr. Seuss, Theodore Geisel, I think his name is. He's, he's deceased now and said, hey, it's not fair what you're saying about Lake Erie anymore. And uh, he wrote back, I got the correspondence. I think it's, it is in the Great Lakes book. He said, you're right, I'm gonna pull it. So if you go down to the bookstore today and buy a copy of the Lorax, you will not see a reference to Lake Erie. But you probably should, because things are bad again. And They're bad again. I mean, but one of the reasons that the problem with, you call it in the book, dirty soap, that's the section in the book. One of the reasons that phosphorus pollution was addressed there I mean, that issue in Lake Erie led to the passing of the Clean Water Act. It was one of the key yes. events that led to the passing of the Clean Water Act. And you write about how that dealt with what's called point source pollution, which is really pollution that you can trace back to a point, like these detergent yeah. manufacturers. Today, we're seeing these toxic algal blooms again, but they're a lot harder to trace back to a specific... No, they're not. <laughs> well, <laughs> to, a, to a specific... Uh place but not to a specific industry so yeah you know the idea behind the clean water act was you can plug a pipe or cap a smokestack or scrub what's coming out of either but a farm field the pollution is so diffuse that uh you can't really stop it and it's it's happening you know on these farms where there is this circle of life that phosphorus really stitches together is happening the manure the poop, the cow would go out to, as I was saying earlier, I won't do it again, but the, the cow would fertilize and uh, the pasture would grow and the cow would produce milk and so on and on and on and on. Well, things have changed since 1972. They gave largely uh, an exemption to non-point pollution, and that was really agriculture at the time. But today, the, the runoff coming from agriculture is driving the problem, and, and a big component of it is these giant farms. And so when you're saying it's hard to trace it back, not if you go to a 10,000 head CAFO and you see the size of the manure lagoons, that is a, a, a point source of pollution by any definition. CAFO meaning confined animal feeding operation. And I guess I, I meant to ask you this last time we spoke, like what, when did that really gain momentum? When did that become sort of the dominant form of... I don't even know if it is the dominant. I think it is, but I don't know. I didn't do a lot of research on that. I just explored it only so much as the notion that once you get your hands on all this pollution, now you can do something with it. And we, you know, I was talking earlier about the British throwing like fabric on the ground and blood and hair. They would not look at these manure lagoons as waste. They, they would drool over them, you know, right. uh, just because it's such a trove of not even just fertilizer, but methane. And, and so this book is not really like, you know, some environmental call to action. I'm just trying to connect dots and paint a picture for people so we can start thinking about how to move forward. Because if we don't, we're just going to have increasingly fouled waters and we're going to have increasingly expensive chemical fertilizer because it's just the supply is, is going to continue to dwindle. But I do think if there's an argument to be made, if there's an argument made in the book, a couple, a couple of them is are whatever. <laughs> I didn't pay attention in English class. Um, <laughs> recognize manure for what it is, and that's a trove, it's a, it's a resource, and, and we can strip the phosphorus from that and put it in pellets as pure as anything that we're mining from, from the ground. And then the other thing that baffled me with regards to agriculture, phosphorus, and the relationship it has to 
algae blooms is ethanol. 40% of the corn that we're growing right now goes to ethanol, which is um, the only people who really value ethanol are the people who make it or make money off of it. And if I can interject briefly, I, I grew up in the heart of the corn desert, east, east central Illinois, and ethanol had a very, a very positive like attitude around it. I mean, I think for people that grow corn, they saw this as like a financial boom in a way. I mean, there's the, the government is subsidizing ethanol, trying to put it into fuel. But your book was the first time I had ever read that you said 40% of like the land mass where we grow corn is used not for food or for feed, but for ethanol, which ethanol is, I mean, has been shown to not really have the environmental benefit that was sort of imagined initially. Exactly. Yeah. 50% in Iowa. And Iowa is critical to this story because if you want to be president of the United States, you, you pretty much have to do well in Iowa because it's at the, for now at least, at the front of the uh, primary calendar. And to do well in Iowa, you pretty much have to pledge allegiance to ethanol. So it's something to think about. I'm, I'm not, that's all I'm saying is something, it's something to think about. There, there, I mean, there's a whole lot to think about in this book, but I kind of want to back up and look at how you were thinking about it as you were writing it. I mean, the timing of when this book came out, you must have been writing this in the midst of a global pandemic, right? Yeah, yeah, that was not easy. What was that like? What kind of challenges did that present? Well, I wrote most of it in my car <laughs> <laughs> because I have four kids and not a very big house and a wife who was working, working at home. And then we got a COVID dog and it's a farm dog and we don't have a farm. <laughs> it's a Sheltie. And so it was chaos in my house and, and uh, I needed more bandwidth. Everybody did internet and otherwise. So I, I started uh, driving a, our minivan, my office over to a park near, uh, near the shore of uh, Lake Michigan and I mean, I did a lot of travel right before the lockdown, thank God, because I wouldn't have been able to get the book done without it. But the heavy lifting was, yeah, it was, it was done, in, done in a car, which is, I'm not proud of it, but you do what you got to do. And now I, I kind of can't stop because... You still ride in your car? Is I work at, yeah. I mean, if you're not driving a minivan, those seats are more comfortable than any chair I have in my house. They can just recline and the sound, the stereo's good. Yeah. I get the internet off of my phone. Uh, I can drive my office over to Jimmy John's. Listen to public radio. <laughs> Listen to public radio. Yeah, it, it makes sense. Yeah, I came up working at newspapers, which were never comfortable places to work, but you learned to sometimes the chaos helps you focus. So before all this started, I wrote a fair amount of the Great Lakes book. This is not entirely relevant, but kind of interesting. Well, uh, one day I was taking the bus. I lived in the, live in the northern suburbs of Milwaukee, and I was taking the bus to the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee where I have an office, and I just got sucked into something, a product of being in New York and riding the subway and just realizing that that isn't downtime. That's time to read. And so I'm on the bus. I'm completely focused. I look up, and I see I missed my stop. I'm like, well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not getting off because I'm on a roll here. I don't remember what I was doing, but I rolled to the end of the line. And the end of the line is Mitchell International Airport in Milwaukee. I thought, well, I got to get lunch. So I got out and I went to, you know, the, the atrium of the airport and um, got lunch. And then I just kind of looked around and there's a, there a piano. The guy was playing the piano. Milwaukee's got a great airport. And <laughs> like this atrium, and it was just so well lit. And then... <laughs> Then there are these massage chairs, you know, $5 for, for like 30 minutes. And I was in heaven. So I spent the afternoon there and, uh, and then I did it again. And then I started doing it like, I, I'm not going to exaggerate, but it was, it was at least two times a week, probably an average of three times a week. And one time, I didn't tell my wife this because she didn't need to know, you know, <laughs> If you take away one thing from this evening's conversation, Milwaukee has a really nice airport. It does. Make sure. It does. So she calls, and over the uh, intercom comes, you know, so-and-so passenger for Columbus, Ohio. And she's like, where the heck are you? I was like, I'm, I'm at the airport. And I started explaining how it was a good place to work. And she, she said, uh, 
just don't get on a plane. And then I was like, whoa. <laughs> I can only imagine hopping on a Southwest, you know, one-way flight to Tucson or something. Um, Those chairs aren't as comfortable as the minivan. No, they're not. But the idea of putting yourself in kind of a distracting situation to help you focus is something that's just a product of how I came up as a writer in the journalism world. So I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. I mean... I guess when the, the, the first book sort of opened, opened the door to the second book, is what, what you've described to me. Like, basically, the success of the first book, the publisher was like, let's do it again. And you, you said you wanted to build a house from scratch. I mean, was that something you anticipated? Like, the, the reception that Death and Life of the Great Lakes got? I mean, it was... No, I mean, I, mean, I guess you're getting that my psyche, but... Uh... You know, it's a very lonely, depressing pursuit writing a book, and especially when you're rewriting material that you, you know, been working on for ten years. And yeah, I don't know if I could write another book because the self-doubt is just so intense while you're doing it. It's like nobody is gonna care. And and then I also don't like public speaking, so this is like I can, I'll yeah. get through this, but when I'm done with this, I'm gonna be tired. So, but I'm in a no-win situation because I don't like you don't like talking in public. But the worst thing would be to be sitting just you and me and nobody here. <laughs> so, so thank you for being here. But uh, is, that, is that some kind of shot at me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. But I understand how you, how you feel with that, which is funny because I work in radio, so I have to talk to the public all the time. But yeah. I will say, when I got the job as environmental reporter at Interlock and Public Radio, your book, Death and Life of the Great Lakes, was sitting at my desk with a note from, the, from Lexi Krupp, who some of you might remember, who was the environmental reporter before me. And it said, basically, you need to read this book if you're going to be an environmental reporter in the Great Lakes. And I, and I think that's absolutely true. I mean, it's really great to meet you and talk with you because this book really does just spark so many ideas for anyone who cares about the Great Lakes, is interested in these issues. It's, it really is a must read. And I would say the same thing about the next one. And what's awesome about this book, The Devil's Element, is that it really isn't just the Great Lakes. Like, this is an issue that's affecting the entire planet. And like you said, once you start thinking about something, you see it everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this is on the forefront of my mind right now. And I think that makes the book a success. If we're, if we're thinking about the fact that what we need to grow our food is poisoning our water, there's clearly a better way to be, there to is. be doing this. There is. And, you know, this all sounds depressing and doomy and gloomy. And uh, on some level it is, but that's life. I mean, we're all gonna die, right? But that doesn't mean that you don't- You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> doesn't mean that you don't take care of yourself. You know, you can't right. eat, I had corned beef hash for breakfast this morning. I can't do that every morning, you know? I mean, I could, but I shouldn't. And uh, I think that's very a very poor analogy for what I'm trying to, uh, to make, but-, but there Phosphorus is corned beef hash. <laughs> In a way, it is. Yeah, you just you can have some, but not too much. And that's when I, that's one of the points I want to make in the book is that you know we need we and I don't want to denigrate or disparage agriculture because I had breakfast this morning and I'm going to have dinner after this tonight and I'll have breakfast again tomorrow. We we all need agriculture and the people who make it happen. They're pretty much just dealing with a system that they inherited and they helped shape it too, but. It's a system that isn't, isn't sustainable right now. And there are things we can do, and I think we can rethink what we're growing, ethanol. And we can also do a much better job of harvesting, of really recognizing that phosphorus is the, like bicycle chains got the master link. <laughs> and uh, maybe that's really obscure, but it does. There's one link that you I can- I like bikes, okay. yeah, I know. Phosphorus is that. I mean, it's it's the thing that stitches the circle of life together, and we cracked that and straightened it out with the invention of chemical fertilizer and turned that circle into a straight line that runs from crops, use it once, and then just flush it away into our water. And that worked for a while, but now we're seeing the consequences with, you know, al toxic algae blooms. And it's not, as you mentioned, a Great Lakes problem. It's not a United States problem. It's a global problem. And... Um, we just need to start thinking more elegantly about how to solve the, the problem of feeding humanity and also providing humanity safe drinking water and water that's fun to recreate in. Definitely easier said than done. It um, is, but it doesn't mean you don't start trying. Absolutely. And, you know, 
typically we think of Lake Erie in the Great Lakes when we think of toxic algal blooms. That's what comes to mind. Um, one thing you touch on a bit that really surprised me is that these are, you know, the, the conditions for these toxic algal blooms, ideally, from the perspective of the blue-green algae, is shallow, warm water, a um, lot of biological activity, a lot of fertilizer. Uh, lake Superior is an example that's a really cold, clean lake on the opposite side of the spectrum of Lake Erie. They're starting to see blue-green algae, algae near the sea caves in northern Wisconsin and the Apostle Islands. We're starting to see it. You write about in, in the Gulf of Mexico. I mean, it seems like these toxic algal blooms are starting to pop up in places that people never thought it was possible to see them. Yeah, and that's it gets back to like when you have a pregnant wife, everybody looks pregnant. You know, are people looking for it more than they had been? I'm sure they are, but there are conditions, and I don't understand the mechanics going on here. But uh, Lake Erie was always thought to be too cold and sterile to support. Or Lake Superior. Did I say Lake Erie? Yeah, yeah. thank you. I got Lake, you. Lake Superior. Um, yeah, it, the, people didn't expect it, but they're finding it. I mean, they're not, they're not problematic to the point that they are in like Mommy Bay State Park where you go in August and the only people you'll see there are these crazy uh, kite boarders who will go out beyond the gunk, but it is not suitable for man nor beast <laughs> in, in Lake Erie right now. And uh, it, it, is, it is spreading and I think it's, it's a function of more carbon in the atmosphere, warmer temperatures and very ample uh, nutrition in the form of fertilizer, in the form of phosphorus. Yeah, and you know the question you asked of, is there more of it or are we just seeing more of it? Just an interesting note, I recently revisited Northland College, my alma mater. There's a center for freshwater research on Lake Superior there, and uh, they're doing soil core samples right now to see if these toxic algal blooms have happened in the past mm -hmm. thousands of years. The, the results of that study aren't out yet, but that will be interesting to see is like, is it true that these have never happened before or that we didn't realize the danger of them and we're just now starting to see that, that yeah. this was a part of this place's past? I know? think that every water body may tell a different story too, because as I understand at Lake Erie in the 60s, that was mostly... It was non-toxic, and so why is it toxic now? And in Lake Erie, there's a pretty good explanation, and that's the arrival of zebra mussels and quagga mussels. You can go on YouTube and see these aquarium experiments where these mussels, they're brainless, but they're smart enough not to eat toxic algae. So they'll siphon everything out of the water column and then spit out the, the, the blue-green, the, the cyanobacteria, the toxic algae. So they're selecting for it, so when there's a bloom, that, that blue-green algae doesn't have competition like it used to. So that's, that's one factor. And then when you look at a map where zebra mussels are, and that map basically reflects the United States and, and beyond. So I think that's a big driver. But yeah, d different lakes have, have different, different stories to tell. But one thing really interesting about lakes and re how they respond to different environmental stresses is how they solved this phosphorus problem in the 1960s with the detergent. Right. Nobody knew exactly what was causing Lake Erie to be the Dead Sea and all these other bodies of water. And the Canadians went way north into Western Ontario and uh, basically gave scientists permission to use dozens of lakes as, as oversized uh, test tubes. And so they were able to dose lakes, the most famous experiment I'll simplify it, but they took one peanut-shaped lake and they dropped a uh, polyurethane curtain to separate the two, and one side got phosphorus, one side got nitrogen, and the detergent industry at the time was arguing that it was nitrogen or carbon, and the side that got the phosphorus was green as a golf course uh, within like two weeks, and the other side was, was deep blue Canadian water, and that woke people up, and that in the law, along with the Cuyahoga River burning, led to the Clean Water Act and to dramatic improvements in water quality. And the question now, I guess, is what's the next Cuyahoga moment? And, uh, well, and was, it, was it Toledo? That's what I wanted. That's what I thought. I, in 2014, I thought, whoa, this is going to wake people up. And the politicians said the appropriate things that, you know, we can't let this happen again. And just like in the 1960s, uh, Science uh, scientists figured out a nutrient diet for Lake Erie and other bodies of water, and that's why we got Dr. Seuss to um, to pull the the words out of the Lorax because it worked. And now we have the same kind of plan for Lake Erie, a 40% reduction in phosphorus into the 
Western Basin, and um, it's not happening. We don't have any laws to, to give it teeth. And again, you don't want to disparage farmers, but you also don't want to put your head in the sand or the manure and deny that there's a problem. And there's a, there's a path forward and th that'll keep food on the table, farmers in business and, and water bodies, if not pristine, healthier than they are today. We've just got to commit to going on it. Yeah, I mean, part, part of my thought there is that anyone else who maybe studied science in school, any, any paper you read ends with like further research is needed. And essentially you have this moment with, with the phosphorus runoff, with the detergent that told people, oh, it's clearly phosphorus, we need to do something about it. I mean, maybe, maybe it's just a case of people being able to identify and show people in a clear way, this is the problem, this is what's causing these toxic algal, algal blooms. And one thing I think we didn't even really touch on is what, what, what do these do to people? Like, why, why are these algal blooms so dangerous? What happens if somebody ingests one that well, does have toxins? I, yeah, I mean, it kills dogs regularly. It's, it's potentially deadly to human beings. I know in Brazil, it got into the water supply at a dialysis center, I think in the late 90s, and killed dozens of people. Um, it's been implicated in some deaths, but never confirmed in the United States. A kid in, near Madison, Wisconsin went swimming in a golf course pond that was all goopy and died. And uh, the coroner, I think he originally said it was a cyanotoxin, a blue-green algae. And then there was some question about some other factors. But it's, it's, it's not to be trifled with. Just because it's natural doesn't mean that it's not nasty. And there's emerging research that it's been associated it's associated with uh, neurodegenerative diseases like uh, ALS. There's been no uh, causation established, but there is correlation out in New Hampshire of people who live near these water bodies. And you don't have to swim in the water or drink the water. It can aerosolize. And there's been increased cases. Now, this is, I'm not saying, I just said, I'm not saying there's a connection between the two, but, but there's, there's cause for, reason for more research, as you would say. Definitely. Well, I guess we're, we're running low on time and are going to turn to some questions from all of you lovely people that have come out here tonight. With, these, with this lighting, it's easy to forget that you're here, which is kind of nice from like our perspective. But now, now they're bringing the lights up and we can see everybody. So we are going to let you guys ask Dan some questions now. Um, and we'll wait for the microphones to get around. We got, we got a question up here as well. I think it was front to the right here. Yep. Is it possible to siphon and then filter out the phosphorus from the lakes and possibly condense it and use it? Yeah, that's a great question. And that may be where we're headed. I, I, I did read something recently how uh, like the port of Toledo needs to constantly, like any port, keep the, uh, the harbor deep. And, and, and what they scoop up is phosphorus rich, but it's also got a lot of other stuff in it. But there's no reason that you can't chemically strip that out. And that's the book ends in this fashion back in Hamburg, Germany, where phosphorus was discovered and where phosphorus burned the town to the ground in 1943 because of the Allied firebombing raids. They're, they're developing a wastewater treatment plant that can pull all the phosphorus, virtually all the phosphorus out of that waste stream. So that's, we keep talking about the hunt and the hunt for phosphorus. Well, mm -hmm. the next hunt is going to be reclaiming, you know, sediments and, and human waste and animal waste. That was a very good question. To, to add one anecdote onto that, you mentioned in the book Madison, Wisconsin, having serious issues with these toxic algal blooms. I have a friend at, in grad school at University of Wisconsin, and they, there's a program there that they're calling Suck the Muck, and they're literally pulling this phosphorus-rich waste, which isn't really what it is, from the, from the bottom of water bodies to remove it from the water and stop it from running into the lake. And that could be seen as a resource, that could be seen as a source of phosphorus. I think we had another question right over here. Yeah, thank you. Um, I hate to um, add politics to what is a really super uh, discussion, but I was reading uh, just today about how the Florida legislature is uh, even fast-tracking 
um, measures that would reduce the power of municipalities to, um, you know, deal with their water issues, uh, would lessen the ability of, of kind of local people to go after developers, et cetera. What, when, when you look at the landscape, I mean, it's really nice to think about how we solve detergent, you know, 30 years ago or whatever, but do, do you see now that, that this is likely to become just caught up in our uh, very, you know, kind of serious political divide in the country and, and does it become kind of a, a left-right issue or, or not necessarily? Is there enough support that is, is kind of across the board? Thank you. Well, it's interesting that you bring up Florida specifically because there's a chapter in the book where um, I go to Florida and and so the, normally this blue-green algae is not a problem in salt water. It's nitrogen drives most of the, the algae problems in salt water. But there's been so much fresh water hitting the coasts because of increased rains that it's fresh watery enough for, uh, for these blue-green algaes to, to thrive. But in, in Florida specifically, the center of the state is, is Lake Okeechobee. And that's connected by canals to both the East Coast at Stewart, Florida, and the West Coast at uh, Fort Myers, Coral Gables, or Cape, Cape Coral. And um, that lake is, is basically a man-made lake, and it's, it was poorly built. And so the Army Corps of Engineers has a practice of releasing, and the lake's just lousy with fertilizer because there's so much agriculture in the center of Florida. So, and, and, and toxic blue-green algae as a result. So to keep the dike from collapsing that contains the lake, they send these toxic flows, toxic algae flows via canal connected to river to, to both the Gulf and the Atlantic coasts. And I went to a meeting in Stewart City Hall, I think it was in 2019, and there were people who were outraged, absolutely outraged. And th this wasn't a gathering of environmentalists. It was across the board and every you know, political stripe was represented and Rubio had a representative there. There were a number of uh, Republican politicians. And so they want this fixed. They want it stopped. And to them, it's not this abstract idea of like saving, saving polar bears 3,000 miles away. It's like they're worried about their property values and they should be. And so I think when economics come into play, then I think we strip the political divide away to a degree and we can find a path forward because it isn't an abstraction. This is an environmental problem that's also a public health problem and a personal finance problem for a lot of people too. I have a question from the live stream audience. Susan Odgers, welcome Dan from Michigan Writers. Discuss a community that has solved this issue or at least in part and thank you. No, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. It's not a community-based thing right now. There are just enterprises underway. The University of Michigan's working with some researchers uh, out in Vermont uh, to, to recycle human waste to recognize uh, urine. For, urine's got a lot more phosphorus in it by weight than feces. Um, Takes us back to 1669, right? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> the pee cycle. Um, but there, there isn't one community that's figured out. There, I was going to go to Sweden until COVID, but there, there, I, and I can't remember the details of this, but there was a town of like 11,000 that had committed to just taking all phosphorus out of their waste stream. Now that's only happening on a real small scale, but we can, what we got to do is just scale all this up. And we scaled up agriculture and, you know, it's done wonders to make pork chops cheap and chicken thighs almost free sometimes. Um, so we, we can, we, if we can solve it on a small scale, I guess I would argue, and I'm not an expert. Again, I, I'm not here to tell people what to do or call them to action. I'm just trying to tell you what I learned from three and a half years of looking into this. And um, there are things we can do, and it's not going to happen on a community by community basis. It's got to happen on a, on a national, if not global basis. Hey, Dan. Hi. It's good to see you. Uh, you. You talked a little bit about the ethanol uh, problem. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you go into any detail at all about the farm bill specifically in terms of 
like you know because I, I did a film on Lake Erie. You've seen my film on Lake Erie, yeah. and the um, you know the farm bill is incentivizing certain types of behavior, and so people keep talking about these regulations, right? Like, well, it's a time to regulate. Should we be regulating? Yeah. But like on the, that's on the one hand, but on the other hand, you've got all this activity that's made perfectly legal legal by the way that this bill is designed every every five years or so. Yeah. Do you have any suggestions in your book for I could I mean, if I were smarter, I'd write a book about the farm bill. And if I had more <laughs> better attention. It's so complex. But I do know that milk, I mean, we are propping up milk via the farm bill to, you know, ridiculous levels. Um I forgot in the book there's some it's it's is it a million millions of tons of cheese are warehoused just because there's nobody around nobody wants the milk and they've got to somehow preserve it and so they preserve it in cheese and then it's it's low grade cheese and they don't know what to do with it it's tricky because you can't turn a cow on and off to make milk nor can you for manure so the farm bill isn't helping, but I'm not prepared to talk about the intricacies of it or how we could work our way out of it. But I think that that would be a, a point to start. Uh, so, yeah. Next project. I do know that the, uh, the soil health folks got $2.8 in this new, this new iteration of the $458 billion that constitutes the bill. So whether that's enough to move the corn growers, you know, from corn to soil health activity. Yeah, they're not, I, I wouldn't bet on it right now. You know, it's just, the, the whole system is kind of out of whack. And it's not, it's not, it is the farmer's fault to the extent that their, their lobbyists, you know, are, are, are advocating for the farmers in the short term, which is what, lo which is what humans do. We, we, we only look three or four or five years ahead. But yeah, I mean, we were dumping milk during COVID, just dumping it on the ground like like manure. And anybody who sees that and thinks that we have a you know a highly functioning agriculture system isn't seeing it for what it is. But yeah, uh, I've always been conscious of the dangers of fertilizing lawns, especially for those of us who near live near, near the lake. And it's phosphorus that. The aspect of the danger in that, and can you speak to the small precautions that we might make in our choices for care of the ground that we live on? Like in Wisconsin, phosphorus lawn fertilizer is banned, and I, I think Scott's, I, I don't know the name of the Scott's parent company, but I think they've pretty much pulled it from, from most of their domestic products. It's a factor, but it's not a big factor. I mean, when they did the assessment of the Western Basin of Lake Erie, I think they found 85% of the load, Dave here may know, 85% of the load was coming from agriculture. The rest was coming from, you know, golf courses are an easy target, but the, 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 the amount of land that they're covering is just minuscule. And, and wastewater treatment plants can get better, and they are getting better. But the big low-hanging fruit are, is, is agriculture, both in terms of over-applying manure and they've got, they're, 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 farmers have gotten much more efficient about using chemical fertilizer, but it's still making its way into the water. And we're also dealing with the fact that we've been using it recklessly for decades because the philosophy's long been, if a little's good, a lot's better. It's like when I'm making chili <laughs> that nobody in my house will eat. And, uh, and that, that's, that's just built up. They call it legacy phosphorus, and it's in the soils, and it's in the sediments, and it's going to be uh, leaching for a while to come. So we're not going to have the quick turnaround that we got with, uh, with the Clean Water Act in the early 70s. But again, that doesn't mean that we don't need to start or moving toward a more sustainable future. Yeah, over here. Hi, Dan. Uh, Ralph Bednarz. I'm a limnologist, so I apologize ahead of time uh -oh. <laughs> for my question. So you're aware of the EPA's National Lake Assessment Surveys, which initiated in 2007 and been going on for the last five years in cycles, or five-year cycles. Um, they found that phosphorus is one of the major uh, stressors in, the biological, in biological conditions of the nation's inland lakes, which is not surprising. Uh, the 2012 NLA, though, also found a substantial increase in phosphorus 
levels in lakes, which have prompted numerous scientific papers asking the question, are oligotrophic systems disappearing in the United States? And oligotrophic systems for the audience are the clear blue pristine lakes. The NLA results show that only 10% of the nation's lakes remain oligotrophic. As you have eloquently emphasized in your book, the impacts of nutrient enrichment and the resulting hyper-eutrophication, i.e. the algal, toxic algal blooms, are profound. However, the impacts of phosphorus on the ecological and economic importance of these high-quality systems are equally important. The loss of oligotrophy and dependent species is the other side of nutrient enrichment. I'd be interested in your comments about that. Well, um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I don't. I don't know. I, I do know. By losing these oligotrophic systems, we're, we're losing a whole system of lakes. They're going to be gone. Yeah, wh when you say 10%, I don't know what the, what the baseline was. Like, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, those are, those are the lakes that are, you know, make posters. And Lake Superior is kind of the, the poster child of all that. And as we were talking, they're finding the, the blue-green algae up there. And I, I don't know. To me, it's like I, I'm not panicked like, oh, my gosh, we're going to have algae slicks on Lake Superior like we have on Lake Erie. But if Lake, if Lake Superior is vulnerable to this, given how cold and sterile and big and rough it is, what lake, what lake isn't exposed to it? And, I, I mean, I guess it comes down to the idea that any lake that isn't exposed to human-released fertilizer pollution so I, I don't know, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure how to answer the question, but w there was a, uh, uh, the congressional auditor or whatever, what, like in 2012, they basically said, the, 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 I wish I could think of the name of the thing, but um, they said, unless we change the, the Clean Water Act to address non-point point, point pollution, we're not going to reach the goal when well, we haven't of making the waters fishable and swimmable. But, but the cause for this point that we're stuck in is non-point pollution, and the source of that is almost over is overwhelmingly agriculture. I think one one quick point on Lake Superior that I would add is that I was just visiting the Burke Center, which is at Northland College, B U R K E. They do a lot of research on threat to oligotrophic lakes and systems and the difference between Lake Superior and a lot of the other Great Lakes is land cover. There's not nearly as much large-scale agriculture but that doesn't mean there's not it's not a threat. There's been a proposal for confined animal feeding operations in the Lake Superior Basin um, and that's something that people in that area are really concerned about. So really the fate and the speed eutrophication is a a natural process on a slow time scale. And I think the speed at which that's gonna happen in Lake Superior has a lot to do with land cover and land use in the basin. So well, that's really the thing to keep the eye on going forward. Yeah, I mean, and there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of crop gro growing up in that region anyway, because it's so cold and the growing season is so short. But there are, yeah, there, I was reading somewhere that there's a big hog operation going in somewhere in the um, Ashland area. A proposal, it, it, it's not on, in the works now, but I don't think it's over. But it was it was moving forward, and there's a lot of public opposition. I, and, I'm yeah. agnostic about about these uh, factory farms as far as whether they're bad for the environment. Just because I, I do think that there are opportunities once you concentrate all those animals, you concentrate their waste, and then you can do something with it. But perhaps even if going down that line of thought, there's a place, and it seems like lakes that maybe haven't had that exposure yet aren't maybe aren't the place, just positing a little. Uh, there, there's a question over here that we want to make sure to get. Last question too, sorry everybody. Hi, I'm Josie Ballinger and I'm also a recovering journalist, an environmental journalist at that. I'm wondering if the report you just, the congressional report you just referred to was by chance from the Government Accountability Office? Yes, accounting, so, it used to be the accounting office. Right. Yeah, so that's I wor I've worked at, the, at GAO for 20 years and in 2016, 
Um, I was the project manager of the report, it, the first report we had done in 20 years on harmful algal blooms. And mm -hmm. so my cute little story is at the 11th hour, after a year of my working with academics from across the country and EPA and NOAA and other federal agencies, my Office of Public Affairs said, harmful algal blooms, you can't put that in the title of your report. How about harmful algae? So there it was. That's what we reported in 2016. We quantified it as best we could, the amount of federal expenditures, and we came up with 101 million over three years. But more importantly, just to give some glimmer of hope to this room, seven years later, another GAO team came in behind me and they just issued a report that not only put harmful algal blooms in the title, but made 10 recommendations to federal agencies to improve the national response. So those recommendations are directed at NOAA and EPA and an interagency task force. To your point about politics, um, my report in 2016 was actually mandated by Republican legislators from Michigan and Ohio after the Toledo drinking water crisis of 2014. There was bipartisan support. Um, and also at the end, after we issued a report, we had Senator Marco Rubio office call us and we actually had Lake Okeechobee mentioned in the very first paragraph of our report. So there's definitely bipartisan interest in this issue. As you said, when it starts hitting economics and tourism and property values and human health, it will matter. And it, it is gaining traction, but it takes time. Thank you for that encouraging report. <laughs> Do, we can do one more question. One more question. Looks like the mic's moving this way. Not sure. We got some hands in the middle here. Back Hi. here. Hi. I, I'm sorry I haven't read your book, but I was wondering if, so you mentioned bones versus human waste versus, you know, cow manure. Is it all equally um, bad? I mean, I say bad because I have no other way to describe it, but like, is it all equally impactful, the source of the phosphorus? As in like, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure I completely understand it, but I don't, it doesn't make a difference where the source of the phosphorus is coming from. It's the fact that it's making its way into the water. And, and, and again, I mean, we need this stuff. We, we, we desperately need it, but we just need to, to control its, its runoff from the landscape better and there are ways to do that. It's just been easier not to. And I guess the only path forward that is optimistic in my mind is just to get people educated to the point that they bend their politicians' ears and, and people, politicians, lawmakers, start doing more than, you know, was one researcher at the, where I work at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee School of Freshwater Sciences said, you know, we've had carrots out there for so long and he, he came up in a farming family. He's like, we sticks help. So leave it at that. Yeah, Dan Egan's new book is The Devil's Element, Phosphorus and the World Out of Balance. I genuinely recommend it. Um, fantastic read all the way through. It's really been a pleasure to have you here, Dan, and thanks for coming, everybody. <laughs>